Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. In this episode, I'm going to be discussing truth. What is it? How can we know it? Does it have an ontological basis, or is it purely logical? After considering these philosophical questions, we will turn to the words of Christ who says of himself, I am the truth. Let's begin. Truth, as postulated by the Greek philosophers, is one of three properties of being called transcendentals. Without going into too much of an explanation, at the most fundamental level, a transcendental is said to be that which transcends genre and is universal throughout them all. The three transcendental properties of being are one, true, and good. Some argue for more transcendentals, but I prefer to limit to just these three for this video. Now something is called one insofar as being is considered as undivided. Something is called good insofar as it has being and movement towards an end. And something is called true insofar as it has being and a mind. Thus, all transcendentals are convertible with being. And though convertible, they are not identical in sense, but only in reference. For being is something as such, while truth is being in the intellect, and goodness is being in the will. So true adds to being conceptual content. Good adds to being movement towards its proper end. And one adds to being undividedness. If this video is on the Trinity, we could discuss how God is being in reference to essence, one in reference to the Father, true in reference to the Son, and good as in reference to the Holy Spirit. But for now, we are just going to expound with greater precision on the transcendental of truth. We have briefly discussed how truth is one of the transcendentals but it still remains for us to consider the subject and definition of truth. Truth has been defined in several ways by the Greek philosophers, church fathers, and scholastics of the church. Though slightly different, they all converge in agreement in one overarching definition. Namely, truth is the conformity of thing and intellect. Now, since the very definition of truth involves an intellect, then the intellect is the subject of truth. So when we say a proposition is true, such as the dog is black, what we are saying is the thing under consideration, namely the dog which is black, has a form in the intellect that is uniformed. That is, the conceptual content as true comports to the reality as being. So in a sense, Truth and falsity is in the intellect and not in things. In order to substantiate this, we need to first describe the intellect and what it means for it to be an act. Since the intellect is where falsity and truth takes its seat, it's only right to briefly discuss how the intellect operates before we can understand what truth is. For the listeners that may be unfamiliar with the term, the intellect is the name we give to the power of the soul which penetrates to the deepest interior of a thing, which we call an essence. It is from this power whence understanding proceeds, since to understand means to read what's inside a thing. The intellect is wholly immaterial and thus operates by a kind of abstraction from sense data. It wouldn't be entirely wrong to think of the intellect as hierarchically above all the other powers of the human person. As such, this power governs all the members of the body into a rightly ordered life. Now, if the intellect is to lead the, pa the passions and the body into a rightly ordered life, it must be equipped with the potency to both see and make judgments about what is true and false. Thus, there are two acts of the intellect. The first act is to receive the form or the essence of a thing, and the second act is to compose and divide. 
When it comes to the first act, the intellect is infallible. However, when it comes to the second act, truth and falsity is found. For it is in the second act where a judgment is issued by the intellect, composing and dividing from this, and a proposition is formed. And since propositions are either true or false, the intellect in which the true proposition is in is true, and the intellect in which the false proposition is in is false. For example, when the intellect forms a proposition by composing a sentence which says, the polar bear is white, the intellect is obviously true. But if the intellect forms a false proposition, such as, a lump of coal is not black, then the intellect is falsely dividing. So then, conformity involves two terms, and these two terms are only conformed if being in the thing has its like in the intellect which apprehends it. What is truth then? In short, truth is right judgment about the beings in the world, which is the conformity between the mind and the thing. Up to this point, we have discussed truth as the correct judgment between an intellect and a thing. When the judgment is right, a conformity is in the intellect, and in a sense, being which is truth. When a judgment is wrong, an imperfect apprehension is in the intellect, and in a sense, non-being which is falsehood. For the thought in the intellect ought always to bear a likeness to the object that is outside of the intellect. That is, the thought of the intellect is what Thomas calls measured. Measured for Thomas means there is something else to which that thought is held accountable and judged against. The something else is what Thomas calls measure. For example, if you think of an apple tree in your head, then you can know if your thought is correct by comparing with an apple tree existing outside the mind in reality. In this case, the apple tree in the mind is measured by and bears the truth and likeness of the apple tree existing in reality. Whatever we experience in reality that is outside the domain of human art is the measure of the truth in our minds. If the mind does not comport with the thing, then the mind is in falsity. There is another relation of truth to the mind which is actually opposite from what we have been discussing this whole video. Up until now, we have been discussing things as the measure and the mind as the measured. But there is also another reference of intellect as measure to measured. This is called art and comes about through the practical intellect rather than the speculative intellect. Examples of art are cars, paintings, computers, HVAC equipment, TV, houses, clothes, tables, etc. All of these things do not exist in reality prior to a mind constructing them from a blueprint within their practical intellect. Have you ever seen someone attempt to draw a picture and then when they finish they are dissatisfied? And when they're asked why, the response is usually something along the lines of, it's not how it's supposed to be. What are they saying? They're saying that the image inside the mind was not able to transfer outside the mind with a sufficient likeness. Whatever doesn't attain to its likeness is said to be defective or bad in a certain sense of the word. This is what someone means when they say, for example, that a table they made is bad. It's bad because it's lacking something which the artisan sees as present in his mind as in a blueprint. So basically, when the art that terminates outside the mind doesn't comport with what is in the mind, then that piece of art is called defective or bad. It's judged as such by the concept in the mind which contains the immaterial blueprint. It is here where we will begin to see why Jesus says, I am the truth.
Thus far we have discussed truth as the conformity of thing to intellect. This conformity can happen in two ways. The first way we discussed is vis-a-vis -vis the speculative intellect, and is measured by things outside the mind. The second way we discuss is vis-a-vis -vis the practical intellect, which is a kind of art. Now God, unlike rational creatures, does not experience speculative knowledge. For there is not motion in his knowledge, since he is wholly above time and motion. Nothing exists as something for God to know. Rather, on the contrary, it exists because God knows it. For what art is to the human mind, so is creation to the divine mind. Now when it comes to art, the object that comes into existence by the artisan is measured by the mind of that artisan. Since the art is measured by the blueprint or the concept of the divine mind, then all that is exists and is true insofar as it comports with that concept. Now when we speak of concept, we speak of that in which the art is seen. The concept, in a sense, is the inner speech of, of the pattern or exemplar from which the practical intellect will terminate its likeness. In the most simple terms, that which is seen in the mind becomes that which begins to exist outside the mind. Now Christ is the eternal concept of the Father, proceeding from the Father even as inner speech proceeds from the intellect. Contained within Christ is the communication of the divine essence by which all things that exist are patterned after as an exemplar. The eternal word is the one speech or concept of the Father who speaks both the Father and the art of the Father at once. He spoke, and they were made. By the will of the Trinity, this pattern or thought will is the first principle from which all creation proceeds out from and tends back towards by imitation. And since something is true insofar as it is conformed to an intellect, then all that is, is true insofar as everything is pre-contained virtually in the divine mind and conforms to it. When one becomes conformed to the divine mind, the one truly becomes conformed to the image of his Son. So what is truth then? Truth is the person of the Word, from whom we pattern ourselves after in order to be good art. Those who are conformed to the Son are truly good in so far as they tend towards and attain to his likeness. Those who are not conformed to the Son are evil, in so far as they are averted from and move contrary to the artisan's pattern. Now since truth is said to be the act of composing and dividing in the mind, then let us all fear lest it be said to us, Away from me, I never knew you. For whoever isn't found in the Son as composed with him is surely found divided from him as an art which failed to realize the artisan's image and be conformed to it. For God alone is the measure of all truth, and his truth is breathing love. Let us press on asking him who is the potter to make us the clay after his likeness and image. Thank you all for watching this episode. Stay tuned for more upcoming content. Until then, God bless.